Part two of Chapter seven and Chapter eight of Animal Ghosts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. Animal Ghosts by Elliot O'Donnell. Part two of Chapter seven The Ghost of an Evil Bird henry spicer in his strange things amongst us tells the story of a captain morgan an honourable and vivacious gentleman who arriving in london in eighteen blank puts up for the night in a large old-fashioned hotel the room in which he slept was full of heavy antique furniture reminiscent of the days of king george i one of the worst periods in modern english history for crime despite however his grimly suggestive surroundings captain morgan quickly got into bed and was soon asleep he was abruptly awakened by the sound of flapping and on looking up he saw a huge black bird with outstretched wings and fiery red eyes perched on the rail at the foot of the four-poster bed the creature flew at him and endeavoured to peck his eyes Captain Morgan resisted, and after a desperate struggle, succeeded in driving it to a sofa in the corner of a room, where it settled down and regarded him with great fear in its eyes. Determined to destroy it, he flung himself on the top of it, when, to his surprise and terror, it immediately crumbled into nothingness he left the house early the next morning convinced that what he had seen was a ghost but mr spicer offers no explanation as to how one should classify the phenomenon it may have been the earthbound spirit of the criminal or viciously inclined person who had once lived there or it may have been the phantom of an actual bird either alternative is feasible i have heard there is an old house near pool in dorset and another in essex which were formerly haunted by spectral birds and that as late as 1860 the phantasm of a bird many times the size of a raven was so frequently seen by the inmates of a house in dean street soho that they eventually grew quite accustomed to it but bird hauntings are not confined to houses and are far more often to be met with out of doors indeed there are very few woods and moors and commons that are not subjected to them i have constantly seen the spirits of all manner of birds in the parks in dublin and london greenwich park in particular is full of them addendum to birds and the unknown though their unlovely aspect and solitary mode of life may in some measure account for the prejudice and suspicion with which the owl crow raven and one or two other birds have always been regarded there are undoubtedly other and more subtle reasons for their unpopularity the ancients without exception credited these birds with psychic properties pliny says these birds crows and rooks all of them keep much prattling and are full of chat which most men take for an unlucky sign and presage of ill fortune Ramsey, in his work Elminthologia, in 1688, writes, If a crow fly over the house and croak thrice, how do they fear they, or someone else in the family, shall die? The bittern is also a bird of ill omen. Alluding to this bird, Bishop Hall once said, If a bittern flies over this man's head by night, he will make his will whilst sir humphrey davy wrote i know a man of very high dignity who was exceedingly moved by omens and who never went out shooting without a bittern's claw fastened to his buttonhole by a riband which he thought ensured him good luck ravens and swallows both at times prognosticate death in lloyd's stratagems of jerusalem sixteen o two he says by swallows lighting upon pyrrhus's tents and lighting upon the mast of antonius's ship sailing after cleopatra to egypt the soothsayers did prognosticate that pyrrhus should be slain at argos in greece and antonius in egypt he alludes to swallows following cyrus from persia to scythia from which the wise men foretold his death ravens followed alexander the great from india to babylon which was regarded by all who saw them as a fatal sign 
"'Tis not for naught that the raven sings now on my left hand and, croaking, has once scraped the earth with his feet," wrote Plautus. Other references to the same bird are as follows. The raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements, Macbeth. It comes o'er my memory, as doth the raven o'er the infected house, boding to all, Othello, that tolls the sick man's passport in her hollow beak, and in the shadow of the silent night doth shake contagion from her sable wings, Jew of Malta. Is it not ominous in all countries where crows and ravens croak upon trees? Hubertes. The boding raven on her cottage sat, and with hoarse croakings warned us of our fate. The dirge. In Cornwall, writes Mr. Hunt, in his work on popular beliefs, etc., of the west of England, quote, it is believed that the croaking of a raven over the house bodes evil to some of the family. The following incident, given to me by a really intelligent man, illustrates the feeling. One day our family were much annoyed by the continual croaking of a raven over the house. Some of us believed it to be a token. Others derided the idea. But one good lady, our next-door neighbor, said, Just mark the day, and see if something does not come of it. The day and the hour were carefully noted. Months passed away, and unbelievers were loud in their boastings and inquiries after the token. The fifth month arrived, and with it a black-edged letter from Australia, announcing the death of one of the members of the family in that country. On comparing the dates of the death and the raven's croak, they were found to have occurred on the same day. In an old number of Notes and Queries, a correspondent relates that in Somersetshire the appearance of a single jackdaw is regarded as a sure prognostication of evil. He goes on to add that the men employed in the queries in Alvin George, Clifton, Bristol, had more than once noticed a jackdaw perched on the chain that spanned the river prior to some catastrophe among them. Dead magpies were once hung over the doorways of haunted houses to keep away ghosts it being almost universally believed that all phantasms shared the same dread of this bird. Ghosts of magpies themselves are, however, far from uncommon. On Dartmoor and Exmoor, for example, I have seen several of them, generally in the immediate vicinity of bogs or deep holes. Witches were much attached to this bird, and were said to often assume its shape after death. Magpies, says Mr. William Jones in his credulities, past and present, are mysterious everywhere. A lady living near Karlstad in Sweden grievously offended a farm woman who came into the court of her house asking for food. The woman was told to take that magpie hanging upon the wall and eat it. She took the bird and disappeared with an evil glance at the lady, who had been so ill-advised as to insult a fin whose magical powers, it is well known, far exceed those of the gypsies. Mr. Jones, in the same story, says, Presently the number increased, and the lady, who at first had been amused, became troubled and tried to drive them away by various devices. All was to no purpose. She could not move without a large company of magpies, and they became at length so daring as to hop on her shoulder. Footnote this reads like hallucination. However, as I have heard of similar cases in which there has been no doubt as to the objectivity of the phenomena, I see no reason why these magpies should not have been objective too. End of footnote. Then she took to her bed in a room with closed shutters, although even this was not an effectual protection, for the magpies kept tapping at the shutters day and night. Mr. Jones adds, the lady's death is not recorded, but it is fully expected that, die when she may, all the magpies of Wormland will be present at her funeral. There is a house in Great Russell Street, W.C., where the hauntings take the form of a magpie that taps at one of the windows every morning between two and three, and then appears inside the room, perched on what looks like a huge alpine stick suspended horizontally in the air about seven feet from the floor the moment a sound is made 
the apparition vanishes it is thought to be the spirit of a magpie that was done to death in a very cruel manner in that room many years ago there is a story current to the effect that a lady when visiting the british museum one day happened to pass some slighting remark about one of the egyptian mummy cases not the notorious one and that on quitting the building she felt a sharp peck on her neck she put up her hand to the injured part and felt the distinct impression of a bird's claw on it she could see nothing however that night and for every succeeding night for six weeks she was awakened at two o'clock by the phantom of an enormous magpie that fluttered over the bed and was clearly visible to herself and her sister the phenomenon worried her so that she became ill and was eventually ordered abroad she went to cairo and enjoyed a brief respite the hauntings however began again and this time became so persistent that she at last lost her reason and had to be brought home and confined in a private asylum where she shortly afterwards died though i cannot vouch for the truth of this story i do think it is somewhat risky to make fun of certain of the egyptian relics in the museum they may be haunted by something infinitely more alarming than the ghosts of magpies there are many sayings respecting the magpie as a harbinger of ill luck in lancashire for example there is this rhyme one for anger two for mirth three for a wedding four for a birth five for rich six for poor seven for a witch i dare tell you no more from further north comes this couplet magpie magpie chatter and flee turn up thy tail and good luck fall me rooks again are very psychic birds they always leave their haunts near an old house shortly before a death takes place in it because their highly developed psychic faculty of scent enables them to detect the advent of the phantom of death of which they have the greatest horror a rook is of great service when investigating haunted houses as it nearly always gives warning of the appearance of the unknown by violent flappings of the wings loud croaking and other unmistakable symptoms of terror owls though no less sensitive to superphysical influence are not scared by it they and bats alone among the many kinds of animals i have tested take up their abode in haunted localities and with the utmost sang freud appeared to enjoy the presence of the unknown even in its most terrifying form the owl has been associated with the darker side of the unknown longer than any other bird in the arundel family a white owl is said to be a sure indication of death that shakespeare attached no little importance to the fatal crying of the bird may be gathered from the scene in macbeth when the murderer asks didst thou not hear a noise and lady macbeth answers i heard the owl scream and the crickets cry and the scene in richard the third where richard interrupts a messenger of evil news with the words out on ye owls nothing but songs of death gray speaks of moping owls whilst hogarth introduces the same bird in the murder scene in his four stages of cruelty nor is the belief in the sinister prophetic properties of the owl confined to the white races we find it everywhere among the red indians west africans siamese and aborigines of australia in cornwall and in other corners of the country the crowing of a cock at midnight was formerly regarded as indicating the passage of death over the house also if a cock crow at a certain hour for two or three nights in succession it was thought to be a sure sign of early death to some member of the household in notes and queries a correspondent remarks that crowing hens are not uncommon that their crow is very similar to the crow of a very young cock and must be taken as a certain presagement of some dire calamity it was generally held that in all haunted localities the ghosts would at once vanish not to appear again till the following night at the first crowing of the cock after midnight i believe there is a certain amount of truth in this at all events cocks as i myself have proved are invariably sensitive to the presence of the superphysical the whistler is also a psychic bird spencer in his fairy queens alludes to it thus the whistler shrill 
that whoso hears doth die whilst sir walter scott refers to it in a similar sense in his lady of the lake the yellow hammer was formerly the object of much persecution since it was believed that it received three drops of the devil's blood on its feather every may morning and never appeared without presaging ill luck parrots do not appear to be very susceptible to the influence of the unknown and indicate little or no dread of superphysical demonstrations doves wrens and robins are birds of good omen and the many superstitions regarding them are all associated with good luck doves i have found in particular are very safe psychic barometers in haunted houses it is almost universally held to be unlucky to kill a robin a correspondent of notes and queries remarks i took the following down from the mouth of a young miner my father killed a robin and had terrible bad luck after it he had at that time a pig which was ready for pipping she had a litter of seven and they all died when the pig was killed the two hams went bad presently three of the family had a fever and my father himself died of it the neighbors said it was all through killing the robin george smith in his six pastorials seventeen seventy says i found a robin's nest within our shed and in the barn a wren has young ones bred i never take away their nest nor try to catch the old ones lest a friend should die dick took a wren's nest from the cottage side and ere a twelve month passed his mother died in yorkshire it was once firmly believed that if a robin were killed the cows belonging to the family of the destroyer of the bird would for some time only give bloody milk at one time and perhaps even now the robin and wren out of sheer pity used to cover the bodies of those that died in the woods with leaves webster in his tragedy of vittoria corumbana 1612 refers to this touching habit of these birds thus call for the robin redbreast and the wren since o'er the shady groves they hover and with leaves and flowers do cover the friendless bodies of unburied men not so harmless is the stormy petrel whose advent is looked upon by sailors as a sure sign of an impending storm accompanied by much loss of life the vulture and eagle obviously on account of their ferocious dispositions often remain earthbound after death and usually select as their haunts spots little frequented by men from what i have heard they are by far the most malignant of all bird ghosts and have even been known to inflict physical injury on those who have had the misfortune to pass the night within their allotted precincts end of chapter seven chapter eight a brief retrospect if i have failed to convince my readers as to the reality of a future existence for all species of mammalia i trust i have at least suggested to them the idea of probability in such a theory for did the belief that all animals possess imperishable spirits similar to mankind only become general i feel quite sure that a marked improvement in our treatment of all the so-called brute creation and god alone knows how much such an improvement is needed would speedily result it is still only the comparative few who are kind to animals the majority are either wholly indifferent or absolutely cruel but if children were made to realize that even insects have spirits they at least let us hope would cease to take delight in pulling off the wings and legs of flies man has hitherto entertained the ridiculously unjustifiable idea that all the animal and insect world has been created solely for his benefit to be killed or to be kept alive entirely at his discretion such an absurd and presumptuous belief ought to be exploded once and for all the animal world so all sane people must agree was undoubtedly created to lead the same free untrammeled life as does man himself man save in cunning is nothing superior either to the dog horse or other mammalia indeed 
he is not infrequently so inferior that one cannot help thinking that possibly the higher spiritual planes are not for him at all but for those who misnamed the lower creation have surpassed man in spirituality let those who doubt this study the superphysical all around them let them carefully watch animals and observe their propensities their psychic faculties of scent sight and hearing they can easily test them in any house or locality which has a well-established reputation for being haunted they will then see how close a relationship there really is between the animal and the superphysical worlds and if they want further proof proof of a more material nature let them search around for some spot stated to be haunted by a ghostly phenomenon in the form of a dog horse cat or other animal and investigate there themselves such investigations have convinced me and surely by using these same methods with patience and perseverance other people might also be convinced at all events let them try for a conviction like mine a conviction that an eternity exists for our canine pets and dumb friends is certainly worth a lot of striving after at least so i think End of chapter 8 and end of Animal Ghosts by Elliot O'Donnell Read by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia, December 2008